Hello, I'm Dr. Grace Liu, and I'm the session chair today. Um, just want to let you guys all know there's free coffee, uh, free Starbucks coffee. It's at the Physicians for Ancestral Health table, which is in uh, the poster room where registration is. So please help everyone help, to help themselves. Um, so today I'd like to welcome you all to day two. Thank you so much for being here and making Ancestral Health Symposium as awesome as it is. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing um, Amber O'Hear. She is an avid nutrition writer and blogger, very, very um, interested in applying research to how diet and diet modifications affect health biomarkers. Um, she particularly has a uh, big interest in how our evolutionary past um, uh, affects our health and lifestyle and diet. So let's give a warm welcome to Amber O'Hear. Thank you, I'm delighted to be here. Um, how do we start the slides? <laughs> okay, so, my talk is called Optimal Weaning from an Evolutionary Perspective, and I'd like to break down that title a little bit. So optimal implies best for something, and here that something is gonna be brain development. The word we weaning can also benefit from clarification because we often use it to mean the end of breastfeeding, but I use the convention of meaning the beginning of the end with the introduction of first foods. For our evolutionary perspective, I just wanna point out that what we know about our past can inform our understanding of physiology, but our physiology can also constrain the possibilities of the past. So I've concluded that weaning infants onto an animal-based diet best meets their nutritional needs, and the rest of this talk will be about why. Primarily, I'll be talking about the unique properties that resulted from the evolution of our brains. I'll also give a bit of evidence for modern health studies and trials. And then finally, I'll give a little bit of the how based on my own experience in weaning one of my children onto animal-based foods. So human brains are unique in many ways, but one of the most striking things is their sheer size, especially relative to our bodies. In particular, when you take into account that we are primates, it's really quite extraordinary. Primates already have brains that are about three times as large as most other mammals, at least relative to their size. And then humans have again about two and a half to three times as large brains as other primates do. And we didn't always have the, that larger brain, that three times expansion occurred over the course of a few million years. And a second related way that our brains are unique is that our individual human brains do most of their growth after birth. It's helpful to think about this in the context of the distinction between altricial and precocial animals, which is based on their degree of development at birth. So altricial animals are underdeveloped. They tend to have a short gestation compared to precocial animals who have a long gestation. They're poorly developed, so they may be missing hair. They usually have underdeveloped sense organs, for example, unopened eyes. They're usually born in litters as opposed to singletons. And they have less adult-like proportions, whereas precocious an animals are essentially adult-like in their proportions. They have underdeveloped limbs, which means that they can't do what precocial animals do, which is move like the adults that they're born from. And they tend to be smaller at birth, and their parents are younger when they reproduce. 
Humans don't really fit into this paradigm very well when you look at it at first glance because they appear to be altricial, but they're actually better understood as being precocial. Primates in general are highly precocial, and humans, when they fit that, are to the extreme. For example, we have enormous newborns and we reproduce relatively late. Our babies appear altricial though because they're born helpless, they don't have adult proportions at all, and they can't walk or have the motor skills that you would expect them to have. But it's helpful to think of them as actually precocial but born early. And one reason to think that is because of fetal brain growth rates. We have our brains growing at the same rate as, as fetuses do, persisting for up to a year after birth. And if you then look at our babies when they're a year old, they look a lot more like you would expect them to look if they were born precocial. They have motor skills um, that you would expect them to have and teeth, for example. Here's a couple of graphs from the Smithsonian, which um, there's one for chimpanzee brain growth and one for human brain growth. So as you can see with the chimpanzee growth, they complete about half of their brain growth in gestation and the rest over the course of a couple of years. Note that chimpanzees, like many primates, wean quite late compared to us. They wean at about four years of age, which is well after all their brain growth is completed. Humans, on the other hand, have a very steep rate of growth before birth, and it continues into the second year. And then the rate slows down some, although it's still pretty significant. And then it's followed by what looks on this graph like a leveling off, but this graph does end at age 10, and we know that there are growth spurts after that too. So what I want to draw attention to with that is that the fetal-like brain growth doesn't just extend beyond birth, but it also extends beyond the end of weaning. So we have this fetal-like growth in the first year, continued rapid growth to five years, continued slower growth through childhood, and then if you combine that with the fact that we wean early, we realize that we need to support that kind of rate of growth even beyond weaning. Our brains are really vulnerable, and they have many critical periods, each of which um, builds on the one before. So if you haven't completed one of your stages of brain growth, you may not be able to complete the next stage successfully. And that means that you need continuous support through a long period of time. So what kind of support do we need to give growing brains? Well, there are at least three kinds of ways that we need to support a growing brain. One is that they need specific micronutrients. Even adult brains can suffer if they don't get enough of certain kinds of micronutrients. And certainly developing brains that are missing these nutrients, if they're missing them at critical times, sometimes they can't even recover from the detriment. Secondly, brains require an enormous amount of energy. At least 20% of the energy that we consume as adults goes to our brain. And that's even more extreme in a newborn who has about three quarters of the energy that they consume goes right to their brain. Um, and then thirdly, of course, we need material for the structural components, and brains are made mostly of cholesterol and fat. In parallel to that, the evolving of the brain had similar requirements. So we needed those micronutrients and the energy and the structural components. We needed them to be available over a period of years for each individual, and then that needed to be compounded more or less continuously for millions of years for us to be able to make that three times expansion. While our brains were expanding over this long evolutionary period, there were co-adaptations that allowed them to expand, particularly contributing to the extraordinarily high energy requirements. So these co-adaptations I would like to talk about in more specifics. A high quality diet, by which I mean high in animal foods, shrinking intestines, a reliance on a ketogenic metabolism, and increased body fat, particularly in babies. First of all, meat eating. The plants that were available to us at the time that we were expanding our brains were simply too fibrous, too low in protein, too seasonal, and too low in calories to provide the needed energy. So significant fatty meat eating was necessary for the protein and the energy, as well as the micronutrients for developing our brains to our current form. 
I'm going to just zoom in on a few of those particularly critical micronutrients. We have the um, minerals, iodine, iron, and zinc. The fatty acid DHA, which is in all your brain cells and the phospholipids, it's particularly important in vision, retinal cells, and in the synapses, and vitamins A and D. If you don't get enough of these vitamins as your brain, or of these vitamins and minerals and fatty acids as your brain is developing, you can suffer developmental delay, disability. There is a tendency to emotional fragility and susceptibility to psychiatric disorders, and it's often not recoverable. So for these micronutrients, animal foods are either the only, the best, or the most bioavailable source. For DHA, it's almost exclusively found in animals. It's true that there is some in microalgae, but it's not very plausible that, that that's where we were getting it while we were evolving. Vitamin D is only available in animal sources. It's true you can get it from sunshine, but again, if you can take into account the seasonality and the various geological periods we went through, um, it's we would need more. Iron is available in plants, but it's three times more bioavailable bio in animal sources. Similarly with vitamin A, which is 12 to 24 times more bioavailable in animal sources. And if you think about the sheer amount of plant food that you would have to eat to try to make up for that, it's just not plausible at all. For zinc is simply, animal source is simply the best. And then I'd also like to note that some plants actually interfere with the absorption of those minerals. So it might not just be not a benefit to try to get them from plants, but it could actually be a detriment. A second co-adaptation is shrinking intestines. So in 1995, Alo and Wheeler came up with a hypothesis to try to explain how it could be that these brains that were growing, which require so much energy, could have gotten that energy without giving up something else. And they noticed that we did give up something else. We gave up a, a drastic amount of the size of our intestines. Intestines are also really energy intensive, so that smaller size freed up energy for the brain. But there is also a feedback loop, because having less intestines reduced our ability to consume fiber. A lot of other primates get a lot of their energy by consuming fiber and putting them through the factory of bacteria that turns that fiber into fat. We no longer have much of that ability at all. And so that also increased our need to get our fat directly from an animal-based diet. Going back to brain requirements, I wanted to reemphasize the structural components. So I had said that brains are mostly fat and cholesterol. By dry weight, it's about 60% lipids, about 40% of that which are cholesterol. But there's a problem because fatty acids don't cross the blood-brain barrier very easily. Cholesterol, almost not at all. So all of that fat and cholesterol is reconstructed in the brain. And it's reconstructed, we know, out of ketone bodies. So that brings me to the third co-adaptation, which is using fat for energy and for substrates in the brain with ketone bodies. Ketone bodies are directly usable by the brain for energy, unlike fatty acids. They're used to create most of the fat and all the cholesterol. And most importantly, they can easily and abundantly cross the blood-brain barrier. But there are other benefits to being on a ketogenic metabolism. For example, it increases the density of mitochondria in brain cells, which allows more energy to flow. And it also decreases the vulnerability of the growing brain to stress and trauma. You may be aware of the extreme neuroprotective properties of a ketogenic diet for example, it mitigates drastically the damage that you would incur if you had a traumatic brain injury or a stroke. So that's obviously adaptive. The fact that we use ketone bodies for brain energy and material, which we and some other species also do in gestation, explains why newborns are in mild ketosis all the time. And infants use ketones three to four times more efficiently than adults, so mild ketonemia for a baby is more like a deeper ketosis for an adult. Even children as old as 12 and probably older can become ketogenic much more quickly and easily than you might expect. We're talking about a matter of hours of fasting to develop the kind of ketosis that would take adults several days. But even human adults become ketogenic more easily than other species, and they do it without, calor without calorie restriction. 
This is really significant. I know of no other species that sustains ketosis without either starvation or semi-starvation, and it has implications for animal models of ketogenic diets as therapies, because there may be cases where an animal requires caloric restriction for the therapy to be effective, whereas in humans it probably doesn't and would be a detriment to compliance and to health outcomes. So I wanted to emphasize that humans have co-opted this trait that was previously an adaptation to cope with periods of starvation, and it still is in other species. But we've co-opted it into a default metabolism, at least for the period of childhood, to support the brain growth in particular, but also to meet the brain's ongoing energy requirements. Finally, the, the last co-adaptation I want to talk about is increased body fat because it goes along with all the others. It's striking, again, when you compare humans with other primates, how fat they are. Even adults are fat compared to other primates. Other primates and most terrestrial animals actually have less than 5% body fat. And humans have easily somewhere between 15 and 20%, even very lean ones. Human babies take that to the extreme. They start out at about 15% fat. That's doubled in, in a couple of months, and it continues to increase over the first year. Baby fat is different in character from the kind of fat you'd see in obese adults. It's subcutaneous, not visceral, and it's very low in polyunsaturated fatty acids, even if their mother is eating a lot of polyunsaturated fatty acids, whereas obese adults tend to have a kind of roughly corresponding um, level and quality of fatty acids to what they're eating. So there's obviously a lot of filtering going on. And what polyunsaturated fatty acids are there are almost all DHA and arachidonic acid, which is another important brain fat. So it seems that this, this extreme body fat in babies is there to provide a continuous supply of fat that can be used by the brain, both for energy and for materials, via the ketogenic metabolism that we are relying on. I seem to be missing a slide. I just wanted to quickly summarize um, what, what I've said about um, evolution of the brain. The first is that we needed to evolve, um, we needed to eat meat to allow us to evolve the brains that we did. That's for energy and for micronutrients. And I also wanted to emphasize the ketogenic metabolism part because not only is it a natural, normal default state for children, um, but it shows that it's not, it's not detrimental. It's actually a benefit. It's actually critical. It's actually part of the mechanism of how we build our brains. And so I'm bringing that up because someone who is thinking about weaning their baby onto animal-based foods might worry, wouldn't this make them ketogenic and could that be a problem? And I just want to emphasize that not only is it not a problem, it's the way it's supposed to be. And you could hardly stop it if you wanted to, because even when they sleep, they're going to go into ketosis. OK, so on to clinical trials. I know of two clinical trials that compared eating, uh, weaning an infant on, onto the fortified cereals that we mostly recommend now versus weaning them onto exclusively meat. The first one compared uh, or took some measurements comparing them, and the meat weaned children had a higher zinc status, which we know is very important. They had adequate iron without the benefit of supplementation that the cereal arm had. They had increased head growth, which in children is a good index of brain growth, and it's also correlated with higher intelligence, and that's not even taking into, effect, into account the um, size of your head at birth. So it's, it's not just the size of their head, it's this, the amount of growth that happened between birth and the later time that's correlated with the higher intelligence. And the second study just showed better general growth without increased adiposity. That was what the researchers were worried about, was that if you weaned babies onto meat, they would get fat in a way that would increase their risk for modern diseases, and that, of course, didn't happen. And I just have... Um, those references there for your reference. This kind of study is what I think has led to certain agencies like the Canadian government and the La Leche League 
to include meat as a recommended first food. So finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to do that, and just based on my experience from doing that with my third child. I was very uh, influenced by baby-led weaning. The core understanding from them is that you don't, you can basically give a baby the same food that an adult eats. The, the risk of, of choking has been greatly exaggerated, and you don't need to buy into this whole you know, factory-made baby food stuff, you can give them what you eat for the most part. So what I have done, for example, um, I was in the habit of making bone broths that had some meat in the broth, and I started by giving him broth on a spoon and increasingly over time added some fragments of meat. I also gave him bones to teeth on from my steaks and chops, and again I increasingly left meat and fat on it, which he enjoyed a lot. I fed him a lot of egg yolks and beef and chicken liver, which have a nice, soft, silky texture. They're extremely nutrient-dense, and to this day, this child is almost seven, and liver is one of his favorite foods, which pleases me to no end. <laughs> I'm really grateful to Aaron for being the first to bring up the word pre-masticate in this conference yesterday, so I didn't have to be. Um, and I also know from being in the audience that several people besides me did pre-chew their food for their babies, and it's certainly plausible. I would expect that a lot of people in the past did that, and I did that. I also uh, often made plain, unseasoned beef jerky, which is really good for teething. It sort of um, reminds me of a dog with a raw hide. He would gum down on it and pull, and then he'd suck on it for a long time, and it would basically just disintegrate also still one of his favorite foods. And I'll just leave you with a couple of photos of that baby, who's almost seven. So on the left here, we have him at six months with a lamb bone that he was teething on. At the bottom, when, I was, when he was two, I discovered that he had liberated a stick of butter from the fridge, because that's so delicious. <laughs> and by two and a half, he was scrambling his own eggs. So this child, basically had almost no plant matter in his diet for the first two years of his life, and even now his diet is primarily animal-based. So um, please give me your questions. Thank you. I understand what you're saying, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so I just want to give a couple of counterexamples. I didn't eat any carbohydrate uh, while I was making breast milk. And although there are medium chain triglycerides in the breast milk, that's certainly not the only reason that babies are in ketosis. Even the babies post weaning that I mentioned earlier get into ketosis very rapidly because it's just the natural state. You can make it, that's why what I'm po positing here, and I'm not, uh, it's not my idea, but what, what I'm saying here is that the baby fat that is there is being turned into ketones just from the fat that's stored on the body, just okay. the same way that I make them. Right. And, and I forgot to mention that I talked about how fat babies are and how fat adults are compared to other primates, and I think it's quite significant. It, it would be unusual to, s to see an animal that that's fat if you thought that we weren't naturally ketogenic mm -hmm. animals. Yeah, and I've, I've, I've actually measured ketones, blood ketones in, a, in, in my daughter when she was still an infant, breastfed only, and it was 1.6 millimole. Um, but I, I, I actually can send you the studies that show that the, the, the MCTs in milk, they go down. And, you, and there's studies where they've looked at giving MCTs to mum, and they don't go anywhere. Mum metabolizes them all. None of them appear in the breast milk. So I think like the carbohydrates for mum, it's not my opinion. It's, there's, I can send you the studies that show that they, that might be important. I'd like to see that. I, yeah. I guess what I'm trying to say is that the ketones that are in the baby's blood don't only come from medium-chain 
triglycerides. Right, right. I, I understand that point, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah I've, I've worked with a doctor that um, he's just finishing up his PhD in neonatal neuroprotection, so he's done quite a lot of research in this area. So, yeah, I'll send you some That's studies. That's fantastic. I would love that. Okay. Thank you. Hey, uh, that was great talk. Thank you. Um, can you say something about <coughs> the, the the time frame and, your, you know, after three children and all of your research and interest in this, um, kind of the, the your thoughts on the time frame for beginning the weaning process and then also um, uh, th how, how large that window of transition looks? Sure. Um, <laughs> I, there's a lot I don't know. But I know that the recommendation currently is to start weaning at around four to six months. And I think that the reason for that is because the amount of breast milk that children get, the caloric input just can't provide much more than what they need by the time they're that large. And so I would say to start giving your baby food as soon as they start to express interest in it. Just you know, let them be the ones who say, I'm ready to start eating, give me that. Um, and then how long it goes, humans tend to wean a lot younger than, than other primates. And I don't know to what degree that's enculturated and to what degree that's natural. Yeah. Um, with my experience, my first child, I, he stopped breastfeeding at about two years. And then each one after that was earlier and earlier, where the last one he stopped at nine months. Okay. So I'm sorry, I don't know more about that. No, no, it's OK. I just kind of wanted to, to see what your thoughts are. I suppose there's some, aside from nutritional implications of how soon or early or, or late you, 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 you move away from breastfeeding, I'm sure there's other implications as well. But it's just it's hard to understand it all. The, I'm a, I just have a newborn, so I was just interested Congratulations. in this. But yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Amber, thank you for an exceptionally good talk. I just had a curiosity question as a psychiatrist. Uh, you having raised three children on this uh, unique diet, uh, which I wish were more common, uh, can you comment at all about how your children fared emotionally and physically compared to their peers? As a mother, I would be very curious to hear. Well, <laughs> there's so much individuality, I don't want to necessarily claim too much. Um, I know that my youngest child does have a very even temperament, especially compared to one of his brothers. But then on the other hand, his oldest brother has perhaps the most even temperament of all. So I don't, I don't know what to conclude about that. One interesting thing that has been commented on to me many, many times is that my youngest child was never, he never missed a single day of daycare throughout when he, he started at two and the, so the entire three-year period, many of his peers, uh, all of his peers, missed significant time to many illnesses, and he missed not a single day. So I, I like to attribute that to his diet. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was fascinating. Thank you. Um, has it been difficult to maintain his uh, diet of high fat um, from a social perspective? For example, when they go over to someone else's house and they have candy or something with other parents? It is a challenge, and the older they get, the more of a challenge it is. My other children also, at the time that I was weaning him, him they were also transitioning to a more meat-based diet. And it, yes, it's, I mean, for example, there, the number of special occasions that you have when you're at school seem to be almost as numerous as the number of days. Like, it's, it's always somebody's birthday or some occasion, and that's always being celebrated with some kind of gluten-y, sugary snack. And yeah, it's a struggle. <laughs> so do you find that he has a sweet tooth, or does he kind of shun that? that kind of stuff? He loves sweet things when he gets his hands on them, but he doesn't seem to be obsessed with them. Um, I just wanted to offer the cross-cultural perspective that the worldwide age of breastfeeding cessation is about four to five years. It's only in the United States that it's young, um, around a year. But if you look cross-culturally, it is actually four years in most cultures. So Thank you for that. So that's for the very end of breastfeeding. Yep, yeah. yep. So that's kind of our biological norm. It's more of a cultural thing here. The other thing that's interesting is around four to six months, infants get a big um, 
bolus of iron from the placenta, especially if we allow for delayed cord clamping. And then around four to six months, that initial iron starts to go down, which is another reason why, like you were saying, meats are such a good first food, but that's why that four to six month seems to be a good time to start foods is because that, um, not that breast milk is lacking in iron and zinc, but that that's not where they're supposed to get it from. You get it placentally, and then it starts to go down around four to six months, which is why traditionally the idea of like, hey, let's put iron in rice cereal, um, right. which we know. Thank you. That's not a really good idea, good but yeah, that's another reason why that four to six month window seems to be a good time for getting those iron and zinc rich foods in. Thanks for the talk. That was very good. Um, the, uh, something that hasn't been discussed so much in this community is um, that weaning and continued breastfeeding is not merely about nutrition, but it's also about keeping uh, the bond between the mother and the child, and that's something that's often overlooked. And I know that there are people who I know who have generally weaned, but you know, when the child is a bit ill or is feeling a little bit insecure, the child will revert for a little while to getting a little bit of breast milk or, or maybe once a night just to say good night. So it becomes part of a ritual and part of a bonding process rather than as an essential continuing of nutrition, which is why kind of as long as you're comfortable with it, there's no harm in weaning in that extent finally later. And that sometimes people feel the pressure, okay, it's four to six months, I better stop by six months or something will happen. And people do feel that pressure, which is why I think in the US and the UK, people kind of feel it's a race to the final cessation of weaning, and it, it doesn't have to be, as right. far as I've heard. Excellent point, thank you. Hi, thanks for the talk. So I have three children also, my youngest is 15 months. We followed a very similar you know, baby-led weaning process as your youngest. Uh, my question is, so my oldest is 11, so we have quite a gap in between them, and you mentioned vitamin D is one of the critical elements for brain development, and prior to my son being born, I had never, seen like my pediatrician recommending vitamin D supplementation. So um, I guess my question is, what are your thoughts on supplementing like drops as a, as a newborn? And also what are some of the better animal sources other than I think fatty, fatty fish to get vitamin D from? Yes, uh, liver, um, fatty fish. Um, I, I'm surprised that you didn't, weren't recommended vitamin D drops because I remember that from even 15 years ago when my first son was born. Yeah, I, I just don't maybe remember it, but it's possible. It's just, yeah. Just, you know, five years between each of them. It's, just, it's, like, oh, it's weird, you know? Right. Did you do those? I did uh, I did do those with the first two children. Um, actually, I did it with all of them, come to think of it. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. I figured there's th it, the amount you would have to get to overdose is high enough that it wasn't going to hurt. Right. Yeah, we did it too. I just wasn't sure. I <laughs> hadn't heard it before him. I was... You mentioned it, so thanks. All right, thank you. Hi, I missed the first part of your talk, which I'm bummed about, but um, I have a four-year-old who regularly steals butter out of the fridge, <laughs> and uh, her first foods were, I think, egg yolk, and I don't think I did liver right away because I wasn't doing that much liver, but now she loves liver, too. It's like her favorite food. Isn't it good? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't particularly like it, but I eat it, <laughs> but she, like, she loves it. Um, uh, I just wanted to add to, I mean, maybe this will be covered in the next talk about um, breast milk and the microbiome, but one of the things that I found interesting about um, breastfeeding and the importance of it for the longer term is that it actually, like, the way that children remove, bre remove milk from the breast actually helps to form the jaw and the palate. And so we see a lot today where women have to go back to work, you know, six weeks, 12 weeks after giving birth, and so they're pumping a lot and babies are getting bottles, and that's really changing the way that we, that our, our mouths are structured, I mean, as are our nutrients in the womb and the palate formation. I mean, anyone familiar with um, Weston Price's work knows that, right? But, um, but I just think it's an interesting piece, too, and I don't think that there's this, once kids start food, it doesn't mean they have to stop breast milk. In fact, those things go together quite well for a long time because of the emotional factors and because of the, the palate formation and sort of the muscle strength and the jaw formation. So. Right. That I think is an interesting, an interesting piece too. And yeah, I've seen um, the same sort of st statistics that hunter gatherers usually breastfed three to four years, and that 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 they actually had a lower body fat, and so that would suppress ovulation for longer, which is why their children were spaced four to five years apart. Um, so just sort of a 
And there wasn't, you know, there was no dairy. People weren't eating dairy, so the only dairy that was available was breast milk. And so the way that that dairy produces certain vitamins, you it know, does. wasn't. Lactose in particular is broken down into glucose and galactose, and galactose yeah. is used to yeah. build some of the brain material as well. Oh, there's other questions, so I'll. Okay, thank I you. I have another question. I'll ask you later. <laughs> okay. Um, that was interesting. Who are you? That's it. It's interesting. It, what she's, that's my whole talk this afternoon. <laughs> please, please come. Uh, nu nutrition is concerned with nutrients, but not mechanical aspects of food processing. And what she brought up was what I was going to talk about a little bit. But that's how great. did you um, learn about baby led weaning? Because that is, uh, for people who might not know, could you explain a little bit about what it is and how you learned about it and how you are executing it with your own children? Well, I'm not sure where I first heard of it, but what, uh, the, the thing that I said that was the core important idea from it is what I've taken mostly from it, and that's that babies don't necessarily need you to mush everything up. You can, you can give them you can give them a, a chicken drumstick and they'll deal with it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to really elaborate on so many wonderful points you made today at 1.30 today. So okay, well, anybody I can come, please. <laughs> that was a great talk. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm the uh, token pre-mastication uh, question. <laughs> So, you know, it, so it goes, you know, you have your first baby and you sterilize everything before it touches their mouth. <laughs> and by the third baby, you're picking up a pacifier and you're popping it in your own mouth before you pop it in theirs. And um, there, was, there was some concern about that in terms of, uh, I guess, uh, oral hygiene. And what I had heard was, uh, you know, it's not such a wonderful thing to introduce your uh, mouth germs to your baby. But if you're pre-masticating their food, perhaps you disagree with that. Yes, yes. So I suppose if you had um, something unhealthy going on in your mouth, that would be a problem. But I, I, I don't really think that there's anything unhygienic about the mouth if you're healthy. OK, <laughs> thanks. OK, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Amber O'Hare, for your talk on optimal weaning in the evolution, evolutionary perspective. Please uh, take a break. We'll take a break for 10 minutes and rejoin at 9.50 um, for Megan's Sanctuary about health-oriented oligosaccharides, babies, and beyond.